and welcome. In our lesson today, we are going to discuss cell organelles. Now, just a fun fact, did you know that in a particular cell, you may have more than 200 cell organelles? Just think about that, 200. Now, before you start panicking, I want to let you know that in our syllabus, only around 15 or so organelles are included. So relax. Now, let us start. What is a cell organelle? Now, a cell organelle is a structure that is found within a cell and which performs a specific function. Now, it could be a single function or it could be more than this. So you have organelles with each organelle specialized to perform a specific set of functions. Now, in this lesson, we are going to talk about seven or so organelles. The other organelles are going to be in part two of this video, so be sure to check it out. Now, with every organelle, we are going to break it down as such. We are going to talk about the structure of the organelle, the function, and then we are going to link these two, the structure and the function, to give the adaptation of the organelles. So sometimes you get questions where you're told, give the adaptation of a certain organelle. Now with this lesson, you're going to be set. I'm going to give you the notes or the points that, you will, that will enable you to score everything in such questions. Now I want to say this, if you would like to note down the points included, please kindly pause the video and do so. Now, our first organelle is the cell wall. Now, the cell wall is a covering that is present in plant cells, but absent in animal cells. Now, the cell wall is made up of cellulose fibers. Cellulose is a type of carbohydrates that is complex. Now, because the cellulose fibers tend to be very rigid, they give plant cells their definite shape. Now, another function of the cell wall is that it protects the inner parts of the plant cells from mechanical damage. Now, another function of the cell wall is that the cell wall is fully permeable. Now, this is actually a characteristic of the cell wall. It's fully permeable. Now, let's pause there. I want us to define these three terms, permeable, impermeable, and lastly, semi-permeable. Now, when we talk about membranes being permeable, that simply means that they allow any and all molecules to pass across. Now, this is the case for the cell wall. So, it allows particles or materials to pass in and out of the cell. Now, when we talk about membranes that are impermeable, these are membranes that don't allow anything to pass across. Now, in uh, organisms, impermeable membranes are rarely found. Now, I want to give an example of an impermeable membrane that we have in our lives. Those are the, the polythene bags that we use. You know, the, the ones that we use for placing maybe foods or such, those are impermeable. Now, because they don't allow anything, be it a gas or a liquid, to pass across. Now, the last one is semi-permeable. Now, with semi-permeable membranes, they tend to have openings that are small. Now, these openings only allow molecules that are small enough to pass across, but not those that are larger. Now, a lot of the membranes that are found in living organisms tend to be semi-permeable. Now, with the case of the cell wall, this is fully permeable. Anything can pass in or out of the plant cell. So those are the three functions of so those are the three functions of the cell wall. Now, how do we form an adaptation? Now, a plant cell wall is made up of cellulose fibers which are rigid. And because they are rigid, number one, they provide a plant cell with their definite shape. And number two is that they protect the inner parts of the plant from mechanical damage. Moving on to our next organelle, the cell membrane. Now, the cell membrane is present in both plant cells and animal cells. Now, in the case of plant cells, you have the cell wall as the outer covering and underneath it is where you have the cell membrane. Now, the cell membrane has a unique structure. Now, this is how it typically looks like. Now, you have a double phospholipid layer. That is, you simply have two layers of phospholipid and between the phospholipids, you have protein molecules attached to them. So the protein molecules are those that are colored. Now, those are the protein molecules. Now, in between the two protein molecules, you have a little bit of an opening. This opening is referred to as a pore. Now, whenever you see a structure that has pores, that means that the pore is there essentially to allow materials to pass across. And that is the case for this. So the pores that are present in the cell membrane allows materials in and out of the cell. Now, as you see, as you can observe, the pores are small in size. 
So that means that molecules that are small enough can pass across. What about large molecules? Mm -mm, they cannot. So this is a characteristic of the cell membrane. It's termed as semi-permeable. So the cell membrane is semi-permeable. So semi-permeable means that it allows the selective movement of materials in and out, depending, of course, on the size of the material. If it's small enough, it can pass across. If it's large enough, no. The good thing is anything that is of importance to the cell can easily pass across. That is, it has the appropriate size. Now, that is the structure of the cell membrane. A double phospholipid layer and protein molecules attached to it. In between the protein molecules, we have a pore. Now, what about the function? Now, one function of the cell membrane is tied to its semi-permeability. And this is, it controls the movement of materials in and out of the cell. Another function of the cell membrane is that it encloses the contents of the cell and therefore protects the inner parts of the cell. So that is the cell membrane. Moving on to our third organelle, and that is the nucleus. Now the nucleus is, um, let's say, the control room of the cell. Whatever activities or whatever processes that happens within the cell have to be given the stamp of approval by the nucleus. So the nucleus controls any processes or any activities that occur within the cell. Now, the nucleus is uh, surrounded by a double membrane. This double membrane is referred to as the nuclear membrane. Now, the nuclear membrane is also semi-permeable. That means it has pores. The function of these pores is to allow materials in and out of the nucleus. Now, within the nucleus, we have two distinct structures. Number one, we have the chromatin. Now, the chromatin contains DNA. I know you've heard of this term before, especially if you watch TV shows or you watch movies and they are based maybe on forensic and such, and you're told DNA and such. Now, DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Now, DNA is a chemical that controls all the characteristics of an organism. That means that every characteristic you have, be it physical, intellectual, based on your intelligence and such, is controlled by the DNA. And this is present within the nucleus. Now, another structure that is present within the nucleus is the nucleolus. Now, the nucleolus contains, oh sorry, the nucleolus has one function. And the function of the nucleolus is formation of ribosomes. Let's pause there. What are ribosomes? Ribosomes are other organelles that are present within the cell. So essentially you are having one organelle forming another organelle. So in this case, you're having the nucleolus forming the ribosomes. And of course, the ribosomes also have a different function. So the nucleolus has one function and that is formation of ribosomes. What is the function of the ribosomes, you may ask? The function of the ribosomes is to form proteins, synthesis of proteins. Now, ribosomes are cylindrical in shape. Now, they, act, they can be present within the cytoplasm or, or they can be attached to another organelle called the endoplasmic reticulum. Now, this is an organelle that we'll discuss in part two of this video. Let's pause there. Just breathe in the information that we have received up to that point, internalize it, and then let's continue with the, the video, with the lesson. Now, moving on to our next organelle, the cytoplasm. Now, the cytoplasm is a jelly-like fluid in which organelles are suspended in. So, these organelles that we're discussing, they are found in the cytoplasm. So, this is where you have the nucleus. This is where you have the endoplasmic reticulum, the mitochondria that we'll discuss, and so on. Now, these are found in the cytoplasm. Now, in the cytoplasm is also where chemical reactions take place. Now, one fun, interesting fact about the cytoplasm is that it's not static. What do I mean by this? It's not constant. It continuously moves. So, this movement is known as cytoplasmic streaming. And this movement is very, very important because it helps in movement, sorry, in transportation of materials across the cell and also in distribution of organelles. So organelles can move from one part of the cell to another through cytoplasmic streaming. How cool is that? 
Now, our last organelle for today is the mitochondrion. Now, I find that the mitochondrion is a favorite of mine. I don't know why, but it just calls out to me, you know. And I also find that this is uh, the same case for a lot of students. We love the mitochondrion. Now, with the mitochondria, let's start with the function. The function is to carry out respiration, which leads to the production of energy. Now, this energy is very important because it is needed for cellular processes, for the processes that take place within the cell. So, the function of the mitochondria is to carry out respiration. Now, what about the structure? So, the mitochondrion has a distinctive structure. It is sausage-shaped and it has a double membrane. An outer membrane and an inner membrane. Now, if you look at the inner membrane, you'll note that it's highly folded to form these projections known as crystals. Now, when we talk about this, uh, adaptations of the mitochondria, we'll discuss why the crystals need to be present. Now, within the mitochondria, we also have a fluid called the matrix. Now, let's move on to the adaptation. And I want to tell you this. This is a very common question with the exams. So these two adaptations of the mitochondria. Now, if you pay attention to this part, you're set. So let's start with the crystal. The inner membrane is folded to form crystal. Let's pause there. Don't say that the mitochondrion is folded. It's not. It's only the inner membrane that is highly folded to form crystal. The function of this crystal is to increase the surface area. Another correction. Don't talk about the crystal providing a surface area. Even without the crystal, you still have a surface area for attachment of enzymes. What the crystal do is that they increase the surface area for the attachment of enzymes. So that is adaptation number one. Adaptation number two is that the matrix is a fluid which contains numerous enzymes. It contains hundreds of respiratory enzymes whose function is to speed up the rate of respiration. So you find that with the enzymes, they are catalysts. They ensure that a process occurs very quickly within a shorter period of time. So for example, a process that may take hours can take maybe just a matter of minutes or even seconds in the presence of enzymes. So with uh, respiration, you have enzymes that are called respiratory enzymes whose function is simply to speed up the respiratory rate. And that, ah, sorry, 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 I have forgotten one last bit regarding the mitochondria. Now, within cells, all cells have mitochondria. But the number of mitochondria that are present from one cell to another differs. Now, the reason is because different cells have different energy requirements. Okay, what do I mean by this? Some cells carry out a lot of processes that require more energy than others. Let me give an example of muscle cells. Muscle cells are required to contract and relax in order to bring about movement. So as you can imagine, they require a lot of energy for this. Therefore, they are going to have a higher number of mitochondria. Another example is the sperm cell. Now, the sperm cell needs a lot of energy in order to propel it towards the egg cell for fertilization. So this requires a lot of energy. So you find that Cells that have a higher energy requirement, like sperm cells, like muscle cells, meristematic cells, kidney cells, liver cells, these have more mitochondria than others. And that brings us to the end of our lesson today. I hope it's been very uh, productive for you and you have been able to take notes for this. Now, in our next lesson, inshallah, we are going to discuss the remaining organelles. See you there.